Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pierre Biffet, and I'm a president of the OFF, uh, the Fringe Festival in Avignon, the Festival OFF. So I won't be able to stay with you because I've got to go elsewhere. But uh, I wanted to just uh, bring up the topic of, uh, you know, cultural uh, policies. This really is a a uh, topic that has never been, uh, uh, or a question that has never been raised. So I wanted to thank the uh, uh, board of directors uh, uh, who, for the past three years, have been structuring this and also for having raised this question and what our stance is with respect to the uh, cultural sector. And of course, so what is our cultural policy. And so for the past three years, the image of this uh, festival has uh, evolved and our, our uh, application of policies has evolved as well. And, uh, you know, we are uh, uh, dealing with the cultural ministry on this uh, topic as well. So I'm very pleased to have you here with me on this topic. For the l longest time, I was always worried that this uh, off uh, festival... Uh, you know, really couldn't even uh, think about the future of all of our, of this trade and uh, being able to raise questions and uh, trying to imagine what uh, tomorrow's culture will be like. So I thank you all uh, for being here and for your respective contributions. Uh, this is my second year here, so we've really got to go this road uh, because, you know, we have to stick together and that's how we can really give meaning to this uh, culture, the cultural aspect. And I'm sure um, that, you know, of course, uh, it's not really through cultural that we'll be able to uh, uh, handle all of the uh, questions uh, of ecology and uh, uh, m migratory uh, uh, movements uh, and uh, so a lot of the politics uh, are very closed on this topic and I do think that culture has its role to play and especially on an international level so thank you all thank you Gabrielle and her team for the excellent work that uh, they have uh, uh, done uh, over the past few days thank you thank you very much Welcome, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the uh, French festival, the Festival Off, as we say here in Avignon. Uh, I came uh, on behalf of Cultural Solutions, an independent uh, association, uh, non-for-profit organization, and uh, uh, whose aim is to have a positive impact uh, on uh, cultural international relations. And uh, the uh, challenge that Monsieur Buffet has just uh, mentioned, uh, this is really important to us as well. So, Perhaps uh, just a few words uh, regarding myself. I live in Brussels. I'm a consultant there for the uh, uh, Transnational Cultural uh, Association, but I'm Dutch, actually. Um, I uh, learned to speak French uh, in Brussels, and but to facilitate... Uh, uh, the moderating and for the discussion purposes, uh, I will switch to English. So for those of you who will need the translation, uh, there is a French, English and English, French simultaneous interpretation. So you can now um, go to the back and get your headsets if need be. Uh, we'll have the discussion most probably uh, mixed English, French. Uh, so I'll... Um, I'll start by uh, uh, quickly introducing uh, the, the very diverse uh, um, panel that we have today. 
uh, I'll start uh, all the way on the on the right or left to you. Uh, that's uh, Pierre Yves uh, Charlois. The, he's uh, the um, associate director of uh, Spectacle Vivant en Bretagne. Uh, then uh, Marta Guiteris, uh, who works for uh, um, Relais Culture uh, Europe. Uh, we ha we also have uh, John uh, Pavel, who is founder of uh, EU Arts uh, Life. Then uh, Ting Wang, if I pronounce it correctly, I hope. Um, who is uh, founder and director of um, Hybridité uh, France-Chine. Uh, we also welcome Hannah Kabel uh, of the Goethe Institute in Lyon. Uh, she's cultural programmer there. Uh, then uh, welcome to Neil Webb. He's head of uh, theater and dance at the British Council. And to my right, uh, Vincent van der Voorte, who is head of... Uh, Artistic creation and cultural policy <laughs> of the uh, uh, project officer. Okay, <laughs> sorry, project <laughs> officer. It was your chance to uh, be uh, promoted <laughs> here. <laughs> um, but uh, your your field is in any case artistic creation and cultural policy at the uh, Région Haute de France. Okay, uh, so but. Um, uh, I think everybody here is not only interested to know who is in the panel, but also who is in the audience. So uh, I've prepared a small uh, survey to have a big, better idea uh, who you are and where you're from. So um, everybody here, uh, who is a resident in France? Okay. And uh, who lives in the European Union? Okay, that's... And who had uh, to cross a continent to come here? Nobody. Okay, all you. No, that's <laughs> all European. Um, and who traveled less than an hour to get here? Less than an hour? So the locals are here? Very good. And who, tra who has traveled more than six hours to get here? A few, so most of them are between one hour and six hours. Um, then I think one, one thing which is very telling for our times and especially for the cultural field is our uh, nomad existence. So who of you uh, calls their home uh, two, two towns, two places? Who, t who has... Ha okay. A few, and may other people that uh, that live in more than than three or more places, who's extra nomadic. Okay, two people, not bad. Um, then um, visitors to the festival, who is here for the first time at Avignon Off? A few people, yes. And uh, who has been here for more than t ten times? Okay, most of them, again, most of them between first and ten times. And who has gone more often to the Avignon off than the Avignon in? Who likes Avignon off better? <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, the director is gone. So. <laughs> uh, okay, so, and then last uh, thing, your professional activity. Uh, so, in your day-to-day uh, -day work, who is directly involved in policy? So, who, who in some way or the other, is, has to do with policy? These, these people here, most of them, but not in the audience. So, uh, a govern, like, a, how are you can in somehow deal with go governmental policy? With the government and at whatever level... Okay. <laughs> um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go further with the next one. Who is from the policy field? Maybe that's easier to reply to. Who's directly from the policy field? Nobody. And who's an artist or producer? Okay, also a few. And then who is involved in the broader field of arts management? So that's, that's the managers, coordinators, communication people... 
support organizations, okay, and uh, who consider themselves to work at the exact midway between the cultural field and policy, a bridge builder between the two, okay. Uh, did I forget anyone? No, okay, I think we've covered it. Okay, then I would like to invite the, um, the panel to uh, give a brief introduction about um, who they are, what their professional background is, and then also specifically uh, speaking about uh, what their relationship is to uh, cultural policies and, um, and policy makers. Um, I'll start here with uh, Vincent. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, yes, so I'll be speaking French, uh, but first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for their invitation. Uh, yes, yeah, you have to really eat the mic. Yes, you. Yes, okay, thank you. So, my name is Vincent Van Porten, and I'm uh, Project Coordination for International Development for uh, the Haute-de-France Regional Government uh, in uh, the realm of cu culture. I deal with all culture, uh, uh, present-day music, uh, visual arts, etc., and so what's my background? That's what you'd like to know? Yes. Okay, so very quickly, oh, we only have five minutes, so I'll try to uh, uh, stay within the time frame. So for the past 15 years, I've been working for the regional government, and uh, over the past seven years, I've been working in European cooperation project called Interreg, which is trans border and I work in developing French and Belgian or French and British uh, cooperation in the area of culture but also you know in um, sectorial public uh, areas also for five years I've spoken uh, oh I was an elected representative uh, in uh, the area of culture and um, for the past three years I'm uh, the uh, cultural relations uh, liaison for the regional government of the north of France between the Picardy region and the Mandy uh, uh, region. And for the past year, I've been uh, dealing with the international cooperation and artistic and cultural uh, cooperation. And before coming here, I uh, read uh, the uh, problems that were raised, and it, I found it extremely interesting because we are looking at creating um, good uh, faith uh, uh, spaces, uh, and so that's really important uh, to support it and enhance it. In terms of space, uh, what I wanted to say was that it, it's a frame uh, and uh, it's a framework, of course, that uh, uh, relies on partnering and financial tools and other tools. And so we really stress uh, uh, live performances, for example, and that's very uh, present here in Avignon this week. And we really have, you know, stressed uh, the engineering and developing and networking of all of the actors who work hand in hand with uh, uh, colleagues uh, in charge of uh, live performances. And, you know, you have to be at the right place at the right time with the uh, artist uh, teams. Of course, the uh, financial part, the funding, isn't just the sole uh, phase. Uh, um, it's one of the phases, but uh, you know, with an emerging uh, firm, for example, you have to structurally look at the project uh, and how it's going to unfold, and to to do this, uh, there is a partnership that we have in 2020-21, we have renewed now, you know, with the network of French uh, diplomatic uh, network, it's a bit like the Goethe Institute in Germany. And a, there's a partnership that did exist beforehand, but based on a very classical approach uh, uh, by uh, helping the artistic teams. But 
first of all, this call for projects. We wanted to diver, have the be diversified beneficiaries, uh, really have them vary uh, so that we don't have all, always the same clientele, so to speak. And uh, uh, those in Paris and abroad, uh, and for them to bring in their know-how. We wanted also to diversify the types of projects, uh, projects of uh, uh, networking and uh, uh, landmarking, um, uh, the encounters amongst uh, an artistic team and a foreign team, for example, we help them. We enhance projects or foster projects uh, uh, abroad or participate, uh, participatory projects uh, abroad. We're very uh, present in the French institutes abroad because uh, uh, that our supporters uh, really uh, do like this type of project. And so we don't uh, exclude, but we help uh, broadcasting projects as well. So uh, that's the call for projects part. Now, a new part is... Uh, it's really the time to support regional uh, cultural policies and support our artistic teams. So for this support, we have set up uh, with uh, the French team uh, engineering sessions and uh, advising uh, advisory uh, sessions, consultants. So Lille, which is the capital of this region, we had invited them to come and, uh, for example, the uh, live performance uh, uh, institute and who were in charge uh, and from Paris, we had them come up to Lille and we had these plenary sessions, uh, things to do, not to do, uh, uh, what traps to be avoiding and, of course, you know, the former emergence. <laughs> Uh, teams, you know, so that they could give some of their experiences, share experiences with us. And in the afternoons were dedicated to workshops and smaller sessions, either per subject or per topic. For example, dancing, uh, theater, marionette. And the problems could be, for example, the issues... Uh, Okay, so I know I'm talking too much, so I'll go quick, quicker now, so, but it's very interesting in any case. And so just to end, I just wanted to talk about the promotion of our artistic teams. And so here today, this week, uh, we uh, have uh, published the URL will be out next week by the French Institute, but we have this publication this uh, that has set up our artistic tools uh, for emerging teams. Uh, you can ask me about this later, but you know, there's about 50 companies in the live performance area. And so, you know, with the, there's the whole network of uh, the uh, foreign, you know, in the French uh, cultural networks, there's about 500 uh, throughout. So thank you. Thank you for your attention, and I await your questions. So you said three, three minutes. Okay. So good morning. I'm very pleased to be here as well. It's the very first time I've come to Avignon. Thank you, and I'm, as somebody said, you know, it's a bit like Edinburgh, but uh, it's, you know, more sun and less, uh, it's less hill, hilly. The other way around. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, hello, my name's Neil. Um, I work for the British Council, um, and I'm the director of, <laughs> I might not be around for much longer, um, of our theatre and dance department, um, and I'm based in London. Um, we were asked to say a little bit about our background. Uh, most of my professional life has been working in Asia. Um, 
So I've been doing this job now for about seven years, but the 15 years prior to that, I worked in Taiwan, in mainland China, uh, in uh, Vietnam, um, and I also went to university in Japan. So um, I've, I suppose I'm kind of re-engaging with Europe uh, <laughs> over these last seven years. Unfortunately, the rest of my country, or at least half of it, isn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really bad timing to come back. Um, so the, the, the British Council is not hugely dissimilar from the Institut Francais or the Goethe. Uh, we describe ourselves as the UK's international cultural relations organization. Um, we are in 110 countries. Um, we're going to have a longer conversation about policy. We are, in fact, we are not a government organization. We are, a, we are registered as a charity in the UK. Uh, but we are in receipt of government funds, which are also getting much smaller. Um, currently, only 15% of our turnover uh, is a grant, uh, which we receive through our Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which is like the Ministre des, des Affaires Etrangers. Um, so that's our structure. Um, we're going to talk about challenges later. As you can imagine, there's quite a few of them right now, but I'm going to focus on the positive. Um, <laughs> so my job, my role um, has always been international. Um, it's always been about making connections for artists, um, exchange, cooperation. Um, that's what I did in Asia. That's what I'm doing now. Um, there's, we'll get into some of the details in terms of how we do that, but at the heart of everything we do is what we describe as cultural relations. So it has to be about creating some sort of benefit and understanding uh, between the cultures of the UK uh, and elsewhere. And the arts is one of the ways that we do that. Um, our organization also, I mean, we are only 4% of the British Council workforce. Um, so the, the education, English teaching, exams, society, governance, all the other bits are actually much bigger. Um, but I like to think uh, we have the biggest impact uh, with, the, with the smallest uh, number of people. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of our work is about creating an environment, the platforms, the networks, the brokering for enable things to happen. Uh, we, as you were also talking about, Vincent, in terms of supporting the emerging, we're very much about trying to help artists as they break into an international career. Um, many of those artists that we, you know, helped 20 years ago are now some of the most famous in the UK. Some, sometimes I think it's, you know, therefore it's time to give someone else a, a chance. Um, and yes, of course, there are particular challenges for us at the moment working uh, or uh, on the horizon, uh, working with uh, the European Union uh, should we in fact leave. Um, but we're going to talk about challenges later. So I'm going to leave it there for now, try and stick with three minutes and uh, hand over. <laughs> Thank you. You're losing your clothes. So, thank you very much for this invitation. I will speak French. It's easier for me. So, I work at the Goethe Institute as of 2012 in charge of programming. I worked in Paris and then La in Lyon. And before I was in Germany for a small structure called Franco-German uh, organization for young artists uh, and uh, before that I was tour manager for a uh, theater company that was called the Titanic uh, Theater and uh, we worked a lot in France and that was lovely so this is the German Cultural Center my uh, good institute is and it's usually, uh, we get the grants from uh, the German government and subsidies, but uh, quite of we, um, there, it hasn't um, um, increased any as uh, the uh, 
uh, charges have, and uh, so it just doesn't follow <laughs> the increase uh, in costs, etc. So we'll talk about these challenges later. So the Good Institute, uh, we offer language courses as well, and information on Germany services, a library in almost every institute, and for me too, I think that it's, uh, you know, the most important thing is to create exchange amongst the artists, the German artists and other countries, and have them come to uh, uh, Germany and have the German artists go abroad, but it really goes to, in, in both directions. In the Lyon Goethe Institute, we try to support the small theater companies, uh, uh, the French companies that work on German texts, and so they can cooperate with a German um, stage director. And uh, But it's quite limited uh, uh, for us, but we also do counseling and we also have a lot of programs that are led by our Munich uh, headquarters that bring young Kurdists to German to discover uh, their theaters there. We also have a, a co-production funding uh, program and with the French Institute, the Institut Francais, uh, we have a program that is for French and German co-production projects. We also have a theatrical transfer for translation of texts and theat theatrical texts. They were present for a long time here in Avignon in a workshop situation and each year we, there was translation from uh, German text into English for example or in French uh, rather. And so have I forgotten anything? No, that was mostly what I wanted to say. But uh, our link with culture and uh, the cultural policy, international cultural policy, well, we are, as an institute, operating in France, uh, we do a lot of French-German um, projects and so on. We do, it's really linked to French-German projects. And so uh, in translation, we do it, you know, uh, in French, but also European. So they really are project bearers uh, for European European projects as well. And we're doing more and more of that, as a matter of fact. And it's more and more important uh, to continue our activity. So that's what I wanted to say. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jing Wang, and uh, I'm uh, uh, from uh, the Hybridities France China. I'm co-director, and so this has enabled us to uh, meet <coughs> a lot of people. And this. Uh, uh, organization is a non non-for-profit organization. We're not an institution. We're not a company either. Our objective, it's like the name, uh, it's to uh, uh, foster French and Chinese uh, interaction uh, through live performances because, uh, you know, I'm a translator and a, a stage director as well. I'm an actress. And so it's really in the concrete work. There are a lot of institutions like the French Institutes and Goethe, you know, that really help, you know, the French and Chinese uh, uh, relations. But I think that there is a lack of a more precise uh, guidance, like right in the... You know, for example, in a real network, I live in China, but I've also been living in France for the past 10 years. And we started helping uh, artists uh, and, you know, guiding them through their projects. We've been uh, working for uh, on producing um, entertainment and shows and French-Chinese <coughs> shows. And we have international French-German uh, international projects as well. But I also wanted to mention, so that you could understand, you know, what our approach is, 
Uh, for example, presently we work on a French-Chinese uh, co-production. Uh, there's a theatrical you know, in Limoges and the Arts Theater uh, with a regional company in China. And uh, so Jean wanted to uh, do uh, Chinese Pandesimi, and it's called Samoa. And he really likes this role. We really spoke about it together, but I know that China also wanted to show this per, uh, this character. And uh, you know, not ju oh, it's in um, um, cartoons. And uh, you know, where uh, does the funding come from? And so there are. <coughs> We are contacting our various Chinese uh, uh, partners to see if they um, uh, are interested in the project. And so we're looking for subsidies together. And so this French-Chinese uh, cooperation uh, really uh, relies on real, uh, you know, uh, circulating all of the information and work together. So we want them to meet in France, uh, but also in other French-speaking countries. So this project uh, of uh, drawing and cartoons um, is in France and in Russia as well. This is just an example. Uh, so I, you know, also write to plays. Uh, so I'm very attached to the language. But you know, when you have the language and uh, you have drawings and the text, we really also uh, help with the translation part. So we really believe in the artists. We we really support them uh, over the long. long Jean-Pierre Perrini, for example, and Anthony Gartox, I invited them to China. And so, you know, really, there's a lot of structures now, you know, that really are asking for him to come back. And so I think we are a tiny little association next to all of these institutions here. But... Uh, our objective is to facilitate, you know, uh, circulation amongst uh, the artists, amongst professionals, and uh, to give our advice uh, and our support. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is John Paval. I'm here with the project called EU Arts Live. Présent notre projet, OU Arts Live, cofinancé par EACA, donc Europe Créative, représentée ici. Vous le rouler, Monta Gutierrez. Sans, sans Martha, je ne serais pas ici aujourd'hui. So, I wouldn't be here without Martha today. My French, I have a mission. We use interactive lines to broadcast living arts. Uh, Living performance, I mean arts, to show what we can do with doing, we can do with interactive uh, virtual reality. Et nous sommes en faire une démonstration entre qu'un simple projet peut mettre en ligne trois retransmissions tous les jours du festival, plus de 60 retransmissions pendant le festival en format de vir uh, interactif virtuel, uh, réalité virtuelle. So why? Are we doing this VR transmission? Uh, because an experience in a uh, uh, stage is uh, very interactive. Every one of you chooses who and uh, what you're watching. Some of you are watching me, others are watch looking at my feet, and or might be watching the other panelists. Everyone makes a choice from one minute to the next, one second to the next. When you're on a sh showroom, uh, interaction is social. It starts on stage with the artists, but you, you lead it to an end. You lead to the end of the creation. If you have the strange mind that uh, a show is a strange product sold for tickets, the public would have to be paid to come and take part uh, and uh, would uh, finish up the creation of the show. And that's where I am. I'm what not I'm in a commercial in English, aspect. When you're in it, a theater or at a ballet or an opera, from moment to moment in the audience, 
Each of you makes choices about who and what to watch. And they change from moment to moment. Film and television with their single passive screen destroy your participation in the social experience of creation of performances. You cannot record a performance. Once you have a recording, it's not a performance. It's a thing. There's no people in it. There's nothing happening that's live. You cannot recreate a performance with the single passive screen of film or television because it kills the audience's participation in the process of creation. But today, now, we have tools, digital tools, which allow us, with 1% of the money that television chains have or films have, to provide you three times a day VR interactive programming where you can move the screen with your with the mouse but to follow uh, John, the actors around. Sorry to interrupt you, but could you because uh, so now? Est-ce que je dois rester dans une langue? C'est ça? Ou no, 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 c'est pas non, c'est pas du tout le minutes, problème. Ou? But I was I'm curious because it's you you mentioned Creative Europe, so it's uh, oui. what you're doing. A EU Arts Live is a Creative Europe project. Could you talk a bit about how the project is set up? Oui, c'était long et c'était dur. <laughs> en, 2000, en 2015, no, I, je suis... I don't, I don't mean how you... L'organisation. You gathered uh, oui. the financing, but just oui. a bit more context about what the project entails oui. in terms of um, your, uh, your contract that you have with oui. the European no, no. Union. Avec l'Union Européenne. So we have five partners in five countries, Sweden, Latvia, Romania... Portugal and France. Each take part of the three show companies. You have the builder of the platform, you have my company in Sweden who manage. Because for Creative Europe, we want to have a collaboration between countries. And so the show companies, uh, performance companies who create and uh, disseminate the shows on the platform created by the company in Portugal, managed by my company in Sweden. That is Creative Europe, and I can tell you that it's impossible to manage. Completely impossible. One of the things that we have to take into account is to work more on a way of making sure that there is a good management of the projects. A simple partnership is certainly one thing we have to take into account in the policy. We like promoting these international partnerships, but what I have discovered after a year is how do you manage five partners, five different countries, if you don't have a central administration. So I've told you m most of what I want to say. I think you all understand. If you have colleagues or friends who would like to watch, we this session is showing on our website https dot dot dash 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 go live to dot eu if you want to point them it's written on all the documents uh, the will be able to find us good afternoon Just can you hear me my name is uh, Marta Gutierrez. I worked uh, for the Rolli Culture Europe. I work, I work more specifically in uh, creative uh, uh, culture uh, Europe uh, projects, uh, which, which have a specific interest. The Rolli Culture Europe is also considered a platform to support innovation in uh, cultural and creative sectors. We consider that it's important to give them elements to be able to reinforce the creative potential in this sector, to lead them to evolve, anticipate, and follow the changes underway at the moment, and uh, give them tools to be able to anticipate and answer the type of uh, mutation the Rolle Culture Europe has existed since 1999, but today, in these points, we have uh, uh, Creative Europe Bureaus. This is the only European program for the cultural and creative sector. It is an investment tool which uh, 
makes it possible to go along with the changes for professionals, the digital and post-digital uh, evolutions and so on. The program today will support the whole of the cultural and creative sector. It is an independent uh, project with its own budget. And so today, the important point, this is a transition period. You know that we are going into a new programming period. We are ending 2014-2020 and we're entering 2021-2027. So to this time it is a hinge period. The European Union is thinking about uh, the cultural and creative sector to see how they can implement the programs to help them progress in their professional environment. It is a public policy uh, aspect. And uh, then there is a reading done by the European Commission on this program. The first reading is uh, digital and post-digital and uh, with cultural globalization. This is something we can talk about what you mean uh, by digital, what is post-digital, and so on. So the first point is innovation. Really support innovating projects, projects which today take into account the cultural aspect in the world today. How can you uh, consider artist creation in the world today? and look at projects that turn to the future, innovating ones, which will bring up new types of organization, new economic models, uh, diversity in creation, all types of diversity with cultural, linguistic, uh, or approach, uh, uh, challenges, uh, as well as stakeholders, all these different aspects. The idea today so in the creative Europe, the idea is to uh, move towards a very creative Europe. It is positive. It's a horizon. And the idea is to be able to manage to create a creative Europe where today you can deal with the cultural issue with a political uh, approach. Thank you. That's fascinating. Good afternoon. Pierre-Yves Charlois, Associate Director of Spectacle Vivant in Brittany, France. Let me thank the festival. Sorry, there's a wasp around. Let me thank the OFF Festival as well, Gabrielle Bay, for her, the organization. I'd like to apologize because I've got a train in now, so I'll give you a presentation now before I leave. So, Spectacle Vivant Brittany is a public establishment for cultural cooperation created by the Minister of the uh, Culture in Region and uh, the Bretagne region. They had how to support the development of professional teams settled in Bhutan, outside Bhutan. We don't deal with politics. We say we increase politics because we implement the policies of the drag and others. So Occitanian and Sen also work on this question of dissemination, as several of us, and they have the operational capacity to act. I'm not going to be innovating because a lot has already been said. Talked about being in the right place, right time, made to measure. We talked about the right space. It's true for international development. What we consider as being space is actually a sustainable inscription of an artistic team in the ecosystem that they have cho chosen. How can we implement systems that support to mobility, to, uh, to, to uh, grants to support uh, dissemination. How can you create a community of uh, artists uh, or professionals, we talked about renting earlier, to give artists the means to deal with this question of mobility and uh, the international uh, aspects. Uh, we call the, uh, uh, this Deploy. It's a two-year program that we're offering artists uh, who have this awareness and this wish to understand the international environment better and how it works. Our artists already find it difficult to see how it works uh, in our regions, nationally and internationally is a further step. So 
a promotion between five and ten teams from uh, Brittany that we will support with individual meetings, collective meetings, mentoring, grants for mobility on IETM, as you all know, large international European network, informal European uh, theatre meeting, and it includes no, performing arts today, places uh, where you can look at uh, prospects. And this deploy program is linked to, to uh, artistic entrepreneuriat. Uh, we don't want to be an entrepreneur in a mercantile way, but we're going to take the power back. So what do we give as a meaning, a value, and become aware that uh, you are a company manager? What are we going to build? What are we going to do? How are we going to be an entrepreneur at an international scale, but realize it does have an impact which is also perfectly local? Let me uh, say what culture of from local to global. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I, I think already these short introductions show um, well, first of all, the, the richness and diversity we have in the panel, but also the richness and diversity we have in Europe in terms of uh, all the different um, levels and approach, approaches toward uh, international um, cultural activities. Um, there is actually one thing that I forgot to mention beforehand. Normally, you should have uh, post-its on your seats, addressing the audience right now. Um, Post-its, yes, did you, did, did you see them? Did you get them? Beca they are meant for you. If you have any questions, you can write them down. And I'll, I'll try to regularly ask um, uh, about it. I, maybe, and maybe there's already somebody now that would like to ask a question after having heard the introduction. Okay, no, that's no problem. There's always one that needs to go first. You realize that, right? So the one that, that dares, and then I'm sure others will follow. Be the, be the one that dares. Um, but, and also, as I said, uh, while we're speaking and you have a question, write it down, and then uh, you, can, you will be able to ask it uh, later on. So um, I think, I mean, uh, so we already had a brief introduction of... Um, of what the, all the different panelists are involved in, but uh, I think to uh, to try and understand a bit better what is happening uh, at the different policy levels, because they do all have their own uh, logic. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Marta, um, because you you give advice to um, uh, practitioners that are uh, interested in uh, that one of the things you do is that are interested in applying for funding at European level. Um, and when you have people come from you, from the artistic field, what is the biggest misunderstanding that, uh, that you get? Creative Europe. Sorry? Creative Europe. Yes, indeed, yeah. yes. Um. As I was saying earlier in my introduction, the European Creative Europe is an investment uh, project, uh, and the only one dealing with the creative sector in Europe. It, so, for, how to design a program in an international and European area? As I was saying earlier, to understand the program, you really need to read what is meant by globalization. That's the first thing. And uh, to be able to have access to the program, first thing need to have innovating projects. Second thing, projects turned to the future, cooperation projects, projects taking into account diversity, and also thinking of an economy in uh, creation. I had the experience coming into Creative Europe and meeting with Martha from the beginning as an artist. The biggest obstacle is we don't know what you're talking about at all. Everything is the obstacle. The mentality of a creative artist who is barely surviving by putting on shows, passing out tracks, getting shows to happen and getting people to come to them 
and the, the mentality of the performing artists who are working on these artistic creations is so far from the rational administrative mentality, we're at other ends of the spectrum of how the human brain functions. That's how far it is. Fortunately, at Creative Europe in Paris, in involving our project, I went through two years of seminars, workshops, sometimes a week long, learning how to explain what relates something like a priority, an administrative priority, to a creative project. I didn't even know what a priority was, and I'm pretty educated compared to most artists because I did a lot of university training. That's, there's a mentality issue. It's a completely different mindset. Just for, for complete Well, to add to that, the European project, particularly Europe, Creative Europe, is really a program. It's not funding to go on investing what you are already doing. There are programs which will really be able to support creations which are going to completely change your jobs. There's answering questions of uh, digital. Today, how can you make it accessible to the uh, cultural and creative content? Who has access to this? We're getting to a very important aspect, which is the digital world. We have a lot of cultural content uh, traveling around, uh, and on connected objects which everywhere, and they're self-produced uh, contents uh, by the artists, by professionals, and the content must be accessible to all. And uh, this uh, cultural and creative content should also provide capacity to the European uh, citizens to ha also have a critical point of view regarding the world today and help transform society. Okay, thank you. So uh, what you're saying is that, it's, uh, that you should see it as a complementary tool uh, to whatever is available at a regional and uh, national level. The, the funding offered by, the, uh, by Creative Europe is not uh, meant as a, as a singular uh, point of access to funding for your creative uh, activities, uh, but it's more as, a complement as it's complementary to, uh, to, what you're, to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, then, um, um, so then we uh, we ha um, if we look at the Goethe Institute or the British Council, <laughs> um, and maybe if I've understood correctly, uh, Région Haute, what you do, Vincent, as well, uh, that you work more at arm's length uh, of the government uh, of the government, basically. You're not directly the government, but you are very closely linked to uh, to government and its uh, policy. Do you, do you see that as well? Um, we point out we are an association, but um, great, extensively subsidized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And there are programming lines over a three-year period negotiated from our, by our head office with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, we have fairly general lines to follow. And then in each institute, we have a certain freedom to decide exactly what our program is going to be. You have liberty as well to set your own priorities then. In the yes, of course. And yeah. could you give an example of um, maybe a program that is uh, now running um, where you, you probably you saw a need and you decided um, um, let's do that? And how was the, how, I mean, how in that case was the relationship with that more general uh, guideline that the German government gives? Um, uh, I am working. Let me continue in French. Well, for the Good Institute, uh, 
Uh, explain what is a middle-sized uh, Goethe Institute uh, uh, with a program budget which is somewhat limited. Here it is, a uh, theatrical festival in Lyon in our program. If we give a small subsidy, 500 to 1,000 euros for a small company who come to us, that is a lot, just to give you an idea. But for a project in cinema, we cooperate because what we do is not so much just locally give subsidies. We do try to create projects together with partners on site. And in cinema, for years, we have been supporting uh, uh, queer the cinema festival in Lyon. We do co-program with them, something that we find very interesting. It means a lot to us. So it uh, fits more or less into the general direction provided by our head offices. But we decide on the spot what is really relevant in terms of programming. Et en termes de financement, je veux dire, bien sûr, c'est toujours uh, le point critique. Où est-ce que vous trouvez ces, les fonds Well, we have our own means, uh, and then today we are involved uh, in a European project which has just ended. For a year we have been involved in another European project. That is something within the scope of these projects. Uh, we can also have uh, workshops, professional meetings, uh, something which is becoming more and more important for us. So I also have the opportunist uh, project, uh, which uh, helps mobility for artists. I have her information on that with me. We also ask for subsidies and support from the, the region, municipality, and so on. The same as everyone else. So you have this opportunist project by the Goethe Institute in uh, Brussels. Well, just to tell you that it's an important period because Europe is uh, defining its new framework for culture. It is a program which in terms of budget, the European Commission made a proposal for budget in 2018 to the European Parliament, who will start uh, negotiating with the new Parliament. When the budget has been increased for euro creative from 1.4 billion euro to 1.8 billion euro. And this is a program which will have very specific objectives uh, to reinforce diversity and competitiveness in the cultural and creative uh, sector. The program will maintain the architecture in the way it was designed and pillars are going to emerge. Pillars are emerging because we are preparing a major program on mobility as for Erasmus but for cultural actors. And we started with a program called Eportunus it's a program which allows the physical mobility of artists. And uh, in the tests that we're doing, it's called uh, the pilot on Eportunus. It concerns uh, performing arts. And the idea is to go off on an individual trip uh, to another country in Europe with a professional project and uh, then have an output. That's uh, 14. In the 14th Vulcans, we're going to send out uh, the that call to prepare the future program for the m mobility in Europe. If it's a, a pilot call, we have another project for music uh, for Europe. This will be dedicated to the musical sector, 
and also have new pillars for heritage, architecture, design, uh, cultural tourism, and fashion. Um, yeah, I think because Ibertunus is a very interesting project, so I, I, I would I would want to, to happily give the opportunity to Marta to explain it a little bit more. But to uh, come back to my initial question, Vincent, I was saying that, um, so if I understood correctly, that um, you work at arm's length from uh, government. And uh, how... how d yes. Yeah, so you're not the government, you're not the government itself, but you are closely linked to it. Um, could, you, you, could you explain a bit more about how you set priorities? Our priorities? Okay. All the regions, I want to uh, uh, talk about uh, decentralization in France since 1982. This would mean a lot of time spent. Regions in France define their own cultural policies, but uh, uh, it's complementary to what is uh, covered by the state, the Ministry of Culture, and uh, it's uh, the RACs in the regions. This new Hauts de France region, for a few, the first uh, objective was its merger, its merger to get the civil servants to work together, uh, artistic teams, uh, the artistic networks. Uh, that was a uh, kind of one or two year transition stage. And today, what are the priorities? Major priorities are to support creation in every form, from experimentation to research, through creation for broadcasting. It is uh, creation and artistic teaching and uh, development of the territory and uh, radiation and attractiveness. Uh, that Internationally, this comes from our artists, uh, and the attractiveness comes from the support to major festivals or events on the regional territory. <laughs> what really was the question? <laughs> um, uh, an interesting answer. Uh, but, and then, as a follow-up question, um, and the same what I had for Hannah, um, like, could you explain how... like? Uh, how is the budget linked to these different uh, priorities that you mentioned? Question extremely uh, well, sensitive. Very sensitive question when we talk about budget. The budget today is really strongly dedicated to creation, cultural development in the territories. And then we have support to projects, but 80% of the budget is to support what we'll call activity programs. We help the annual operation of many structures in terms of equipment, cultural structures, but also artistic teams. And uh, we also help projects uh, in a more punctual way in cultural st structures, festivals, and artistic teams, uh, um, uh, more emerging, other small structures. And now to answer your question, uh, the balance between uh, the different budgets uh, for the four focuses of our budget, the international aspect, uh, indeed, uh, what I just said uh, regarding the French Institute, uh, the very modest amounts, and that's why I'm talking about engineering and methods used uh, more than the money, which is 140,000 euros per year. That's really prosaic. And we also do cultural uh, cooperation with Flanders, uh, the Glamsverheit, uh, with the region of Flanders. And uh, we also have a uh, uh, hundred thousand euro budget for that, and we also uh, assist emerging uh, artists uh, uh, or those who want to come to France. Uh, and we are uh, in the process of working uh, for uh, with regards to aid. Uh, for artistic teams. Uh, this is coming up uh, in September. 
And it's a, a bit uh, like a mirror effect, uh, like the pilot program of the European Commission. And, of course, we have uh, aid, you know, for creation uh, purposes as well. But I just wanted to talk about the Opportunities uh, uh, Project. You know, it was important for me because, actually, uh, we really uh, realized that it was a, a very, you know, Europe was a very strong, solid structure, and for the opportunities, you know, there was, it was administratively actually quite complex, but so were the uh, projects amongst the partners. And so there was a huge demand coming from the commission, and but also individually, uh, you know, they really wanted to be more flexible and have more mobility. You know, we're, I'm talking about artists to physical persons uh, and not just generally speaking and so they wanted to foster a mobility uh, a prior to the project the meeting uh, and, and encounters and how could we you know uh, foster these meetings uh, it's very small it's like sometimes we can just do a thousand euro grant for example so it's uh, even that and you know for 2021 to 27 uh, within, uh, you know, the framework of these European projects, I think uh, we're going to be more, it's going to be better balanced. Uh, in, in, we're going to work, you know, with uh, uh, smaller projects uh, instead of these great big huge structural projects. Oh, I'm going to have to leave. So, I hope that you uh, understood what we do in Brittany and how we work with the international projects. I would like to thank the interpreters that I didn't do a moment ago, so thanks. Thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful um, uh, festival right through to the end, and see you next year. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? No, not yet. So, since we're talking about policy and how it influences us and what we do, um, the UK is probably the complete opposite of France um, in that um, it's not centralized. Uh, culture and the arts are one of the things that is devolved, which means the four nations of the United Kingdom um, essentially give or take, make their own decisions about their own cultural policy and the investment. So Wales, Northern Ireland, England and Scotland are all slightly different. And we're in an unusual position in that we are one of the minority of organizations in the UK that works across all four nations. And in... How are... The, 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 the aim is to represent the interests of all four nations. We don't necessarily always succeed. I'm looking uh, at some of my colleagues from Scotland in front of me. Um, but the point is, in terms of how decisions are made, uh, where money comes from, what decisions are made about what money to spend where, uh, like everything else in the UK, it's very complicated. Um, because in some cases, those programs might be representing all four nations. In other cases, it might be a partnership, for example, between Creative Scotland, which is the, the national funding body in Scotland, and us, targeted very much at the interests and international objectives of Scotland, which are often very different from those of England and Wales. So it's, yeah, in, in terms of a, a directive, we do have the equivalent of a of a Ministry of Culture, but it's the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, um, which does everything from gambling to horse racing to uh, television to museums. Um, in fact, it's, very, it's quite rare that we work directly with DCMS unless it's some very, very super high profile, you know, big exchange between France and the UK, for example, most of our work is um, we, in terms of policy and, and how the international policy is decided is working with the arts councils and Creative Scotland. 
because that's where, and, and also different arts councils also set international policy and provide funding to do it. Um, I, I'm not saying this because Katie's here, but I'd say Scotland, Creative Scotland is probably the better of all of our arts councils in terms of really understanding how to work internationally and the money that's put in, not just through Creative Scotland, but also through the Scottish government. So the Scottish government through a, through a fund called the Expo Fund, um, which is set up to maintain the international competitive edge of the festivals in, Scot in Edinburgh particularly, um, the international, the fringe, the science, the book, everything. Um, but that fund is very much about supporting the international ambitions and the international platforms uh, for Scottish artists um, and maintaining Scotland as an internationally focused and European place. <laughs> could, so we could should all go to Scotland then. <laughs> <laughs> could I say... No. I'm moving. <laughs> could I say something about this? Um, and it may not sound like I'm talking about policy, but I am in a way. If we want to be successful in promoting the performance arts in the future, we need a lot more money. The money is there, but in order to get it, we need to be present on a global scale. A film opens on three to 4,000 screens to start a weekend, takes in more money than all the commercial theaters in the West End and on Broadway in one weekend. Now... But if, and if you talk about we, what, what do you mean I'm by we? I'm talking about the performance arts community needs to get online and create a broadcast audience. The model is sports. The, 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 over 90% of the revenues for sports comes from broadcasting. It doesn't come from selling tickets in the stadium. And there's sports channels broadcasting 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because at any given hour of any day, there's all kinds of sports going on. The same thing is true for live performance arts. This planet is exploding with live performances, and almost none of it's online. The dramatic arts and entertainment online is all recorded, which means it's dead, which means it's not us, which means it's not this festival. It's canned, dead material. My passion about the project we have is that Creative Europe has helped us to finance building a platform on which anyone who wants to, with a very modest investment, any performance arts company can start broadcasting. Any group of performance arts companies, any country's minister, uh, ministry of culture, which wants to form a federated group of performance arts companies and equip them so they can start broadcasting, we now have the infrastructure which cost us 1% of what film and television infrastructure cost. If we can start building the audience in the global community, which is there, because they're all going to see these shows live. If you go to any small or medium-sized town in any country, when a good show comes to town, it sells out. Everybody loves to performance arts, so there is a mass audience. But it needs to be done with these new interactive formats so people recognize, oh, this is like being in a show. You see what I'm saying? So and that, if we can do that, then instead of instead of uh, performance arts companies going to governments asking for money, it'll be like sports. If we can create a broadcast audience, 10% the size of the sports audience, the revenues we will generate, we'll be sending money to places like the French Institute or the Goethe Institute rather than going begging for it. The way professional sports is overflowing with money. We won't have as much as them, but if we have 10% as much, that changes the whole playing field, and then policymakers will be figuring out how do we spend all this money coming in. So, I, so you mean that as long as there is enough exposure, if, as, the, as long as the exposure is big enough for cultural events, cultural creations, uh, that is enough to, to attract a bigger audience? Well, the key is networking. Most of the experiments that have been done with broadcasting online are one company at a time. 
Now, if you're the New York Metropolitan Opera or the British National Theater, that works. But if you're your typical individual company, even a medium-sized one, you don't have enough reach. But give me 25 medium-sized theater companies, and they pool their audience together, now you've got a much, much bigger audience to start to build. So the key is all in international networking and building networks of performance arts companies, and then they can start planning shared complementary programming and doing incredible things. Mm -hmm. So I would just want to encourage in terms of policy, thinking in terms of moving, and, and it's been started. I mean, five years ago, they had a big conference here, and everyone was talking about numérisation de la culture. And every now and, now and then, though, I raised my hands, and I said, well, how about actually putting our shows online? People looked at me like I was from the moon. Now they're saying to me, that's a good idea, John. What do we do next? So I, I, I really think that the future is occupying the Internet terrain and thinking about how the policy can get us out there with what we do online, not just websites that sell tickets. Okay, okay. thank you. I mean, a very clear statement. Ting, uh, maybe can I can I ask you to reply to that be, or to respond to that? Uh, because, uh, I mean, you're a mediator between French and Chinese culture, if I may say so. Uh, do you, if if you would have bigger exposure the way John is uh, suggestion suggesting, would that help uh, your organization and the organization of your goal, uh, the goals of your uh, organization? Would that be enough? Would that would that attract a bigger audience uh, to um, to your activities to to Chinese spectacles in France and vice versa? Yes, I think that would be very helpful for the circulation of artists, but also you have to have the access of all of the sites that you can see in France and in China, because not all of the documents can be consulted in China, that's the truth. Um, but I find that that's also very important. Uh, this uh, digital form that does foster exchange, but uh, the live performances or the performing arts, you know, you have to go to the theaters. I think you should go there and uh, see them, and, you know, in order to take a final decision. For example, when I uh, work at Ibridities France China, uh, we often work with institutions such as the French Institute in China or the cultural department of the Chinese embassy in France. And often the programmers don't have time to, in China, can't travel to Europe all the time. And so um, our uh, programming consultant, as a programming installant, I'm in France, and so I don't look at the video on internet. I go to the theater, I look at it, I watch it as something that I like. Uh, I like uh, to, con uh, to uh, uh, advise that you go and see it. And so counselors or advisors such as myself go out and look at it and then recommend it or not. And so um, we go physically out. And I think that these tools uh, that, of course, I'm sure do facilitate uh, this type of exchange, I think that we really, I think it's really good to have dialogue amongst the actors, uh, you know, could have the information disseminated, have interaction, you know. <coughs> I think, you know, that's just a support, but I think it's the humans that really, human beings should really meet one another. Yes, our uh, broadcasts online, uh, the, the aim is to have those people who have never gone to the theater, we want them to say, oh yes, well, that would be great to be there live. So if you look at all of these festival goers, you know, uh, people who go to the theater, you know, those that are 25 years old or younger, they don't know theater, really. 
I had one person who worked for me a few days, and this morning he left on vacation, and he said to me before he left, he lives in Avignon, and he said, thanks a lot for helping me discover the theater, and uh, he's a young guy, j just left this morning, and so, uh, you know, I took him out, and it was 11.30 at night, and, you know, I took him around to see things, and he was thrilled, so I think that we could accompany them and guide them along, and then after if we do it online, and then they'll come out to the um, uh, <clears throat> to the shows. Well, yes, I think that there are some artists that don't like to be uh, recorded. They don't like to be filmed. They don't like it. They're not comfortable, and they don't want it. So, but the issue is, you know, how can you, you know. Um, uh, broadcast uh, a, a live performance. You know, it's never the same as the live. There are technical uh, problems to overcome. Well, yes, but that's the it. You have to integrate the preparation of the broadcast in with the uh, the theatrical production, for example. So even during the rehearsals, and you know, you have to do a pre-production. You can't do post-production with uh, recordings uh, that aren't well prepared. So. So, uh, operettas and uh, theaters and plays, you know, we can do it in our project. If they can do it, then the others can do it. But it's, there still is a cost. Yes, there is a cost involved. ...of uh, how to uh, broadcast live spectacles. I'm sure there's still many uh, aspects and challenges oui. to overcome. Oui. But to get back to the, to the topic of international policy, uh, I, I noticed that there was a question from the audience. And do we have a mic? Yes, I'm Aurélie Fons. I work in uh, uh, cultural projects guidance and uh, support. Uh, I travel throughout Europe, and uh, I was in Euro Africa and uh, Eastern Europe recently, and uh, I really am struck by what you said because it, it, with respect to, you know, how can we, uh, well, this is not a question, but uh, I just wanted to contribute to this because I find that you are a bit skeptical, ma'am, uh, with respect to uh, the gentleman's proposal. And uh, you see, and you are very passionate about this, sir. And so I feel that you're a bit skeptical, ma'am. And so I think that's the difficulty of uh, uh, really um, rendering visually, you know, a live performance. And, of course, this um, relationship, the rapport that exists between the actor and his or her public is like a catharsis that uh, happens uh, that is lacking uh, in a broadcast. And, but I think that it's true, these broadcasts, uh, what role does it play economically in uh, circulating the works as well? And I think it's an important question to raise uh, in the various experiences and mine as well. And I'm really uh, uh, fear the, the disappearance of England from the European Union, uh, you know, and uh, the, all of the off, uh, the, the fringe uh, um, events. Uh, I'm afraid that there is very little production outside of the English language. And so there's little space for opening up to the public in other languages other than English. And so, yes, uh, there is a need for um, a training of a public, educating the public, and uh, open-mindedness, and the question of translation of the texts as well, and uh, subtitles. Um, but um, also a festival that is a meeting place for creation and creativity beyond France. We have very few uh, foreigns, uh, foreign speakers, uh, you know, uh, who speak our language, uh, very few Africans, East, uh, Eastern Europeans, etc., who speak French. And
and so it's difficult to uh, go out and uh, meet uh, the public and the various artists and so um, yes uh, there are programs that are not really easily accessible to people that are outside of France because as you said we do need to understand the methodology and the institutional language to access uh, this type of international broadcasting and uh, so of course there are intermediaries but to what the encounters amongst the artists and of course you know with digital yes of course uh, uh, and uh, the sometimes it's the digital aspect that helps them exist actually so the question should be raised uh, even though there are certain limits and restraints and, and constraints involved. I just wanted to add, this is a, to add to what you have just said with respect to this question uh, about uh, uh, the digital um, operations. Uh, I just wanted to say two things. It's what space do we want to uh, give uh, digital? Uh, is it the technique, tech technical aspects that are in-person so, or really the, the, the people or the public that's important? So we you really have to see what uh, place will be occupied by. And so secondly is the type of company uh, that will be produced. Uh, there are companies with huge platforms, uh, American type, uh, but also we can have uh, um, rather uh, more shared, more collaborative, uh, horizontal platforms perhaps that could enable uh, for us to do everything that you mentioned so we really have to hone it down and work on it because the digital ask of is a policy question, yes, with respect to society, indeed. Thank you. Um, so we don't... Um, ah, okay. <laughs> Encore une question? Pardon, merci. Yes, thank you. I'm Mathieu, I'm a stage director and I work with a young um, Franco-German creation and I do transborder uh, program on um, the public and so how does the audience, uh, the French and the German audiences, uh, how do they uh, enjoy it, what do they get from it and so it really, is, you know, my work actually relies on the audience and that's what where it all starts. And so their interest in culture is comes from their intimate experience as an audience. And maybe this is the spot that we have to um, look into uh, and not just look at the audience as being someone else, but us, ourselves, myself as a stage director, and or you as cultural institutions. You know, how do you have, uh, you know, timely uh, um, projects? How do you create those? And so uh, you should be questioning our role and our uh, place uh, as an audience and uh, what the space that we occupy as an audience in the uh, plays that we go to see and we can change something and obtain the um, artistic and cultural landscapes so uh, that and also it's all based on our wishes and what we desire as well uh, the, the project you mentioned uh, the exchange uh, between Germany and France the project that you're involved in uh, is it uh, is this, it's publicly funded, the project that you're doing? La platform. Uh, the platform is an association and the projects are supported by the uh, French-German Youth uh, Office. I don't know what status they have, whether... I think it's an international organization. Yes, Hannah. Actually, the French-German uh, Youth uh, uh, Bureau is uh, funded by both governments, French and German. 
And it was created in 1963, I think. Yes. Okay. Fine. Thank you. And youth is uh, means until 30, age 30. <laughs> So it depends. The project, uh, they offer projects very early on. Yeah, even really from uh, uh, infancy uh, right through. And there is a lot of exchange programs, and even third uh, countries are involved. Uh, they can uh, give their projects. So it's really interesting for us, that structure, that organization. Um, taking the, um, the performance of spectacle as a starting point to something that we always need to focus again and again on. Uh, do you, I mean, I'm trying to make the link with policy. Do you, un do you feel understood in this, in this d desire or this wish that you have? Do you, do you feel understood by policy? But I don't know, I mean, I don't know if you have, um, you directly are in touch with uh, policy makers, but in the framework that you work, do you think there's, uh, this, this is hurt, this message of um, uh, concentrating on, on the performance, on the artistic output by policy? Alors, je pense que on s'est mal compris. Mon propos n'est pas de se recentrer sur. Actually, I think we misunderstood each other. What I wanted to say wasn't to focus on the artist or on the show, but on the audience, the spectators. And for your question, the answer is no. Uh, in these encounters, uh, we note that the um, speaking time uh, is much greater uh, for the person on stage rather than to the people in the audience. And of course, the spectators have the questions and the artists have the answers. And it's the same in the political sphere. Uh, so, you know, you, we want to bring the spectator in to the decision-making uh, process and uh, feel that the spectator has a, a real uh, weight to carry. Well, I have something to say that. I think that it's in cinema and television that has ch changed uh, the uh, social psychology. In theater, uh, the, uh, the audience is a part of the creation. And in film and television, they impose things upon the public. And so, therefore, it's less participatory. And I feel that a whole century has gone by where we've seen the growing influence of the dramatic arts that render the public totally passive. And that's why I'm so passionate and I love you all uh, because, uh, uh, you know, I want, uh, because of this other aspect of social creation that uh, really awakens the spectators and includes the spectators. And, uh, and I think it's like a renaissance, uh, renaissance of the performing arts. Uh, and instead of just passively looking at the screen, well, Spiegel said, I'm going to have to look at this. Do you see what I mean? Maybe it's not true, but that's what I imagine. Bonjour. Good afternoon. We have talked about Eastern Europe, Central Europe. You, you see few artists coming from there. Let me introduce myself. Katarina Varga. I'm Franco-Hungarian. And uh, very quickly, I don't want to take too much time, but I would like to explain that I am correctly disseminating with the track printed on both sides two shows of Hungarian origin at the Maison de la Poésie from two authors, Attila Rochev, to for him to be discovered. Okay. 
And if you look at the Earth Mound, you'll see why not, it's not only for my promotion. I mean, I think we're a bit from the topic now. We have another question. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's... Je ne pouvais pas écouter, excusez-moi ce que vous dites. Parce que... Voilà. D'accord. Thank you very much for presenting what you do, but I think we... I mean, the, the, the topic is the international cult cultural policy field. Alors, and I would like to, to go back to that. Pardon? No, I would just like to say that we have had our culture translated into French. Uh, it's also been mentioned on France Culture, and uh, one of the shows has been accepted. Let me, I would just like to say that we counted ahead that the financial investment will will not see any return. The we love this culture and the public coming to see it will love to see it. Also, already we, even if we did everything, during the shows, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven people, and we play with the whole of our heart, and we give pleasure. So I just have a question, simply. What could we do so that with so many efforts, without thinking of uh, support, subsidies, or grants, or anything, just one thing for the public to watch? But if, I mean, if I, uh, I, maybe it's a good thing. I hear a couple of voices. I hear a couple of voices saying that maybe we don't need a policy field anymore. The On peut peut en après de manière plus informelle. I think we can discuss it more informally and come back to political issues. Another question. Thank you very much. I'm Bob Lewis from the British Council. I'd like to go back to your policymaker um, question because for me, I feel that policymakers across the world in the artistic uh, field are very passionate about supporting and developing mobility of artists. My, my question is, are we now in a different world where the funding is beginning to dry up, where countries are moving to a populism, where um, all governments are questioning the funding that they are putting forward and trying to reduce the amount, amount of money that is uh, available through reduction in taxation, through focusing on a smaller number of things and giving people the choice to spend their money in a different way. And therefore, my question is to you, how is uh, Région Haute de France, how is uh, Goethe uh, Institute, and how is uh, Relais Culturel with its access to Creative Europe funds going to be pushing and encouraging governments and global institutions to continue to fund artistic world. Who would like to start? Alors, pour l'Institut Goethe. So, for the Goethe Institute, every three years, there are negotiations between our head offices and a representation of the German parliament. There is a parliament of uh, commission and the Goethe Institute to negotiate. And our president and uh, manager do everything they can to get more funds each year. Sometimes when the level is stagnating a bit, we, we make do. And it's us on site in the local institutes who have to find solutions. And I must admit, depends on the regions, but for Western Europe, it is quite difficult because our expenses uh, go up every year. So every year there is less money available. 
for the the projects. That's a true challenge for us. When we are told find uh, more, um, we do more fundraising, more borders. I think uh, uh, it's very difficult. The uh, businesses are more interested in funding sports and culture. We do manage to convince some from time to time, particularly for major projects, but it does remain a big challenge. Neil, would you like well, to...? I mean, it was my colleague that asked the question, but I, I will respond, because ironically, um, having been on the trajectory that Bob is describing of reduced funding, reduced funding, reduced funding, um, we are also in the stage of renegotiating um, our budget for the next four or five years. And we are actually, this is why I said the irony um, in a possible post-Brexit world, um, negotiating to significantly increase the amount of money we have to spend in Europe. Now, whether or not we'll get that or not um, is a whole other question. Um, but I'd say there is a point at which you can go too far, um, and we might be very close to it. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, uh, so challenges also brings opportunities then. <laughs> but actually to take the question a little bit further, because I know in terms of especially uh, coming, talking from the cultural field, uh, I think like the main interest in policy, the policy level is funding. But taking it further, where do you, do you also see opportunities for policy to... Uh, be of influence and to cooperate, to collaborate with the artistic fields, which goes beyond funding. In terms of cr maybe creating a framework, um, I mean, Creative Europe is a lot about uh, uh, mobility, for example. Uh, I mean, I, th I think those that have been in uh, the experience of doing a Creative Europe project, and John already mentioned it, you're obliged to work together with people from Uh, different parts of Europe, which is often not easy, but it also um, makes you get to know different parts of Europe, how uh, working practice is there. So this would be a non-financial benefit of uh, what Creative Europe is about. Do you see other possibilities for policy to have a positive influence on the creative field that goes beyond funding? Yes. Um, <laughs> and since you mentioned Creative Europe, I mean, one, we, the British Council is involved in a number of Creative Europe projects, um, but one of the biggest ones that currently um, in Europe is the Europe Beyond Access project, which is a, it's a four million euro project of which two million euros are from Creative Europe. But the point um, that Marta was mentioning earlier, it's about, it's about the transformative power and approach. Um, and this project is about transforming both the perception of disability arts, the access to disability arts, um, the access for disabled artists to that. It is a, in a sense, it is a social change project um, where artistic excellence is at the heart, but it's disabled led, um, it's disabled creatives, um, but it is influencing policy um, I mean, this is an area of work which I can get quite passionate about um, when we do a lot of it around the world in the British Council. And it is an area where I have seen the power of art changing policy in countries. So as a result of our disability arts work in Korea and Indonesia, for example, both those countries have established ministers for disability, which did not exist before. Um, which to me is an incredibly powerful outcome of an artistic intervention. Um, so yeah, there are lots of examples. Of course, having the two million euros to get going is does you know that helps too. I can imagine. Maybe Vincent, can I uh, address you because uh, Lille was a European cultural capital in uh, 2004. It's already uh, some time ago, but uh, Lille is known as a very good example of uh, of a European uh, cultural capital. Do you do you see do you still see uh, effects of having been the cultural capital in 2004 now? In terms. 
Well, I didn't prepare that question. It's 15 years. Lille was the European capital of culture in 2004, and uh, it generated a lot of attractiveness. Uh, the city, its artists, uh, its uh, know-how, uh, heritage. I'm trying to be quick because I've had a train to get in 25 minutes. Uh, so today, the con medium-term consequences, or more long-term, since 2004, are that it really generated uh, recognition of Lille and uh, the old France region. It's seen as a, a place for artistic creation. That is the main interest. It was a long-term investment. It wasn't just an event over a few months in 2004. It was an event which had a short-term, medium-term, and more longer-term effect. I really would like to thank you. I'm delighted to have met you. Cooperation, first of all, is meeting. It's very interesting. Thank you for moderating. Thank you for your invitation, Gabriel. So, goodbye, and uh, enjoy the rest of the festival. Well, thank you. Um, but we, uh, we're actually almost uh, uh, through with our time, so there's uh, room for one last question. Nicolas Bertrand, I have a question. Point five, we can see that there are different approaches, like the idea uh, just for the audience or the madam offering meetings uh, through her shows, depending on the participants in the panel. In what place? Other places where the cultural actors in the field can take part in preparing policies. Martha pointed out the changings that we have to face. Where do you think are the places where we, as field actors, need to go to defend or prepare? Well, for uh, 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 Creative European, in 2017, uh, there was a, a public consultation for all the cultural and creative sectors, and this was uh, disseminated very extensively everywhere. And it is, was from the feedback from the field that uh, the project is being put together for Creative Europe was a program which will be designed thanks to the mobilizations of the musical sector who got together for the first time at a European scale. The whole sector, the whole musical chain to define the needs of the sector. So from this work which started in 2015, 16, 17, 18, was a report, a working group on music, I can't remember the name, giving rise to so the uh, Europe um, pilot music, which defines needs in terms of uh, training, dissemination, in line, offline, in terms of innovation, and also uh, sports music. And uh, if we go back to uh, sectorization, it's important to consult the different sectors and their professionals in order to develop the programs. The Commission needs a critical mass and we need to work on uh, feedback from the field. And I said the consultation which took place in 2016 and 17 for the future program, which is being implemented. Okay, thank you very much. I get signs that we need to stop the, the round table. Uh, so uh, thank you once more for the panelists to uh, be here and to have shared uh, your thought with us. Uh, also to the audience, thank you uh, to have been here and to, ha to have been listening and asking questions and uh, intervening. I think I agree with Vincent. Uh, I mean, 
encounter remains very, uh, very important, both live and online. I think we need to use all, our, all of the tools that we have. Uh, all formats have advantages and disadvantages. We also need to work with that. Uh, but um, um, the, the important thing is that, that we keep the conversation going and that we try and keep to, um, to uh, get closer together, whatever field uh, or from whatever um, background uh, we're coming from. So uh, thank you once more and have a good festival.